Looking at our world from a theological perspective, this is the Theology Central Podcast, making Theology Central. Good afternoon, everyone. It is Monday, July the 17th, 2023. It is currently 2.13 p.m. Central Time, and I'm coming to you live from the Theology Central studio located right here in Abilene, Texas. And it's everyone's favorite time. It is sermon review time. The reality is, I don't know if it's anyone's favorite time. I I really don't know if it's anyone's favorite time. I always want to believe that, hey, you know, whatever I'm doing, hey, it's law and gospel time. Yay. Hey, it's sermon review time. Yay. It's today's focus time. Yay. I I, I want to, in my mind, I want to believe that everything is everyone's favorite thing, but the reality it isn't. I don't really know I don't dig into the numbers enough to really try to determine this is our my most popular series. This is my the most popular thing. I try I can sometimes judge by emails, but let's just be honest. What what do you think? When I get an email, do you think it's more likely I'll get an email when someone is mad, upset or has a complaint or I get an email when someone really liked a message? If you think it's more common for me to get uh, emails when people say, great job, thank you, really appreciate you, uh, how can I support you, what can I do to help? No, those are in the minority of the minority of the minority. Typically, you're going to get an email when people are like, who do you think you are? You were so wrong. And an attack, 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 attack. Because people are much more likely to email their frustrations than they are their support or approval and uh, their encouragement. You don't get a lot of encouraging emails. Now, I, I do get some, and I am so grateful for those. But uh, so, so sometimes it's hard to know. Like the 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 people who tend to be angry or attack, they just tend to be more vocal. So you can't really judge anything based off that. You got to make sure you kind of put it in perspective, right? So um, I'm always grateful, but. I, the bottom line is I don't really know if that if sermon reviews are really people's favorite. I have a good time with them. I think some of you do. So that's what we're going to do. And why are we going to be doing a sermon review on this Monday, July the 17th? Because it is July the 17th. And that means this evening at 7 p.m., This evening at 7 p.m., the 2023 National Sword Conference begins. The 2023 National Sword Conference begins this evening at 7 p.m., broadcasting live streaming from North Carolina, the National Sword Conference. You can keep up with all of the conference at swordofthelord.com, swordofthelord.com. It's live streaming there. It is free. We are going to pay attention to it. We're going to keep up with it. And the reason we're doing this is because I like to keep my eye on what's going on in the world of Christianity. Here's one of those conferences that are free, live streaming being live streamed to be free, which I always applaud that. They don't even charge, I think, people to attend it in person, which I applaud that. And it just, it's it's an opportunity for you and I to kind of get insight into what's going on in that particular theological world, that theological stream. And that is more of the independent, fundamental Baptist, KJV KJV only, sword of the Lord world. And so we're going to kind of get a glimpse into what's going on there. What do they think is important in 2023? Uh, What are they concerned about? What's their spiritual focus? And so we are going to be keeping up with that. If you would like to participate and paying attention and taking notes on the 2023 National Sword Conference, and then sending those those notes to me, we would really appreciate your help and helping out because 
I don't know if I'm going to be able to watch all of it. So if you watch some of it and take notes, then we're going to have someone compile all of the notes into a PDF. And then we're going to kind of give our report of, hey, here's what happened on day one. Here are the messages. Here were the speakers. Here was the text. Here's a summary. Here's questions people had, or here's my thoughts or my concerns. We'll compile it all together, make it into a PDF, and we'll make it available to everyone. So it'll be like our little snapshot of what's going on in that world of theology this summer, the summer of 2023. Now, the schedule, just so that you know for the conference, begins tonight at 7 p.m. There's two speakers tonight, Shelton Smith and Dan Carr Sr. That'll be at 7 p.m. and then at 8 p.m. Tomorrow, day two, starts at 8.30. There's a seminar. (laughs) Obviously, they're not in favor of Calvinism called Combating Calvinism. That begins at 8.30. Then 9.30 a.m. is Matt Morrison. 10.30 a.m. is Ron Titus. 11.30 a.m. is Mike Wells. Then 1.30 to 3.30 p.m. is the School of the Prophets. 7 p.m., Lou Rossi. 8 p.m. is Jeff Fugate. That's day two. Day three, basically the exact same schedule. 8.30, 9.30, 10.30, 11.30, 1.30 to 3.30, 7 p.m. and 8 p.m. Day four, the exact same schedule. So you'd like to jump in and say, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll watch the 11.30 a.m. on day two. Then great. Then we know that, hey, that you're good to go. If you can participate on any of those times, just email me, newsif at yahoo.com newsif at yahoo.com and tell me if you'd like to see the schedule, go to swordofthelord.com. There's a blog article right there about the conference and they lay out in a chart all the sessions and you can pick which one, say you're going to take notes on it. And then I know I don't have to pay attention to that one or other people don't. And we'll kind of keep a track of it and we'll just see. I think it should be fun. It should be fun. But what better way what better way to prepare us for the sword, the National Sword Conference of 2023? What's a, what a, what's a better way of preparing ourselves than, than going back to the National Sword Conference 2022 and picking a sermon from that conference? I think this was sermon number three that was preached at that conference. So it would have been the one that began day two. It probably would have been the first sermon of day two because it looks like day one is typically two sermons. This would have been starting day two of the conference in the summer of 2022. What are they going to be talking about? What do we think? What do we think about the theology? Most importantly, what do we think about their hermeneutical method? What do we think about how they handled the text? Their interpretation, obviously, their hermeneutic. What method are they using to drive that interpretation? Do they, well, we could just, we could talk hermeneutics here, but we will not. Are you ready? Now, the audio here starts kind of low, and then somewhere in kind of the his introduction, they they switch something over, right? Either they switch to a new mic, you kind of kind of hear this click, and then I won't say the volume gets louder, but it gets kind of fuller, and hopefully it will be loud enough for you. If the introduction is a little quiet, I apologize. I have the volume cranked all the way up and uh, you may have to crank your volume up. Whenever we're doing a review and there's a major difference in the sound volume, I know it can be irritating on your side and I do apologize for that. I just will try to be mindful and when I come back in to offer my criticism, critique, thoughts, and analysis, I'll try not to you know blow out your eardrums, all right? If I do, just yell at me and, uh, well, I won't hear you, so it really won't matter, but you can yell at me. All right. Are you ready? Here we go. We're going to go back to North Kakalaki, North Carolina, summer of 2022 to the National Sword Conference. This was the first sermon of day two. Tonight, July the 17th, 2023, begins the 2023 National Sword Conference. Sounds good. Hopefully you'll participate. Are we going to agree with everything? I think we're pretty sure we know we will not, but it should be fun to kind of just see what's going on and we'll get to hear a lot of preaching and we'll definitely utilize that to our spiritual benefit. Let's go see what was going on in the summer of 2022. Here we go. 
Baptist Church, and uh, this is the 25th time that I've had the privilege to stand behind this pulpit at this conference, and we were at the Sword uh, at the headquarters two years in a row, had a wonderful time there, and the Lord did some great things, but it is good to be back here in Walkertown today, and uh, what great messages last night. Uh, by both speakers. Uh, I've already changed the message twice now. And uh, the first message, I said, oh, there goes that one. And uh, what a great message on uh, how that God can, and he sure is able. Say amen. And then the second message on the solid rock. Uh, Brother Morris, he did a great job, uh, both speakers. And so I said, well, there I go again. The good part is I'm first this morning. So now the other guys, are they're throwing their sermons out, getting another other one, and uh, they're sitting in the hot seat, nervous, biting their fingernails. I'm going to preach and be done, and uh, I'm so glad to be here today. I want to say that uh, publicly, worldwide, where whoever's listening, I want to say that life, his family, his ministry, he has been a blessing and a dear friend to me for a lot of years. He was a friend to me when he didn't have to be, and I appreciate that so much. And uh, I thanked him this morning that I always know Dr. Smith is the same. Amen? He's going to keep, in a good way, he's the same. And we have a generation of people that are changing, swerving, dropping out, as we heard about last night. And I thank God for people who are the same. You don't have to wonder what he's going to preach. You don't have to wonder what Bible he's going to preach from. He's not going off on anything. He gave us a few new words. I think uh, uh, he's not going to charismatize or uh, contemporary eyes or any other eyes. He's going to stay with the Bible, say amen. And we're thankful for Dr. Smith this morning. Turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of, of Mark, chapter number 5. The book of Mark, chapter number 5. I've been wrestling this morning and last night. I began to preach from Matthew 16 where Jesus made that incredible statement, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We'll stay away from that this morning, and I'm going to look at Mark chapter number 5, and I want us to begin to read this morning from verse number 25. Okay, now before he gets into the text, a couple of things. I do love that phrase that I've been wrestling with, wrestling with. I love that imagery of a pastor sitting in a study wrestling with the text. Now, sometimes I wish the wrestling with the text did not stay in the study I wish the wrestling of the text came to the pulpit and then you invite everyone in to wrestle with the text with you. So many times I feel like pastors wrestle with the text. They look up commentaries for their particular theological team, figure out what their team says, and then just go with that. And the wrestling doesn't really translate over. It doesn't transfer over. But I like my approach is, hey, guys, here's the text. There is plenty to wrestle with, and we're going to wrestle with it together. We're going to struggle. We're going to ask questions. We're not going to worry about which team gets offended. I don't care who gets offended. I'm not worried about the team. I just want to know what the text has to say. And then we figure it out together, acknowledging what we can't say what the text doesn't say and acknowledging what, when we can't answer certain questions. So I love that imagery and hopefully in your Christian life, that really describes your relationship with the Bible. It's a constant wrestling match. It's a constant struggle. There's like, Oh, what about this? And what about that? And, and this, and I I don't know about this. And Oh man, this is confusing. And Oh, I don't know about that. And you truly experience that. It should be a wrestling match. That's my take. And so I love that imagery. He's going to go with Mark chapter five. There's a lot, there's a lot of things we could do. He could do with this. I don't know which way he's going to go. I think he's going to begin in, I think he said Matthew chapter five, or Matthew, Mark chapter five. He mentioned Matthew 16, Mark chapter five, uh, starting in verse 20. 
5. Mark chapter 5, verse 25. That's going to be the text. Oh, there's a lot. He, I don't know which way he's going to go with this text. I don't know. We're going to listen. I think we're going to get some indication very early on. Now, what we listen for whenever we do a sermon review is we first we want to establish, does he establish what his thesis is? Here's kind of his thesis for the text. Then we try to look to see, does he acknowledge context? Then we look and see, does he acknowledge historical context? And then we want to pay attention to how he handles the text. Is he really worried about what the text means? Or is he just going to grab something from the text so that he can rush off basically to a topic? Is this going to be text-based or more a topical message where the text is simply a launching pad to said topic? We're going to pay close attention to all of that. All right? Sounds good? Here we go. I have a generous amount of time this morning. I will stay within that time, and I appreciate speakers who get up, stay in their time frame, and sit down, and I appreciate uh, so much the man I know that will do that in this conference. Mark chapter 5. Verse 25, let's stand together for the reading of the holy, inspired, infallible Word of God. Mark chapter 5, verse number 25. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou, Who touched thee, or who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole, Go in peace, be whole of thy plague. Our text is a great and well-known chapter in our Bible. It's the account of a woman who'd been sickly for 12 long years. She'd gone to every physician that she knew about, tried every cure. If you're ever preaching in a meeting, never make the mistake of telling people that you're sick. Because after the meeting, they're going to give you more cures and stuff than you've ever heard about in your life. Especially if you're an evangelist. They'll come knock on your trailer door. They'll bring you stuff you never heard of in your life. Bone broth, carrot juice, colloidal silver, and everything else under the sun. But this woman had tried it all. She'd spent everything she had. She had likely got to the place where she had given up hope. But then she heard. She heard about a new physician who'd come to town. One who'd come to help and to heal. And she said, I'm tired of all these other physicians. Okay, now this is just a, a, an issue. I, it's, it's for preachers, but it's also for those who listen. Whenever, as a preacher... When we read the text, and let's say it's, it's like in a narrative, it tells kind of a story. Here's the story of this woman with an issue of blood, who had an issue of blood for 12 years, right? So we're, we're, the te- we, 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 when, whenever the text gives us some kind of story, it could be about David, it, could be, it doesn't matter. It could be about Joseph, Joshua, it doesn't matter who the story is about. When preachers will read the story as given in the text, and then pastors inevitably retell the story in their preaching. And typically in the retelling of the story, what do you want to call it? We begin to embellish. We begin to 
add. We begin to try to paint a picture. And when you start painting the picture of the story that you just read, so here's the story. Here's the original picture, right? So like if you were to, if you were to like try to visualize this, let's say on the left hand side, there's the original picture that captures the actual story of the woman with an issue of blood. A pastor comes along, reads the story as it's given in the text, then begins to retell it. But just watch, sometimes when he's done retelling it, does it really look like what you read? Because he starts adding in emotion. He may start narrating the thoughts in the woman's mind. He starts giving you a lots of background that may not be in the text. Now, most of, the, most of the time, listeners seem not to mind this. They seem to enjoy it, especially if he's really good at doing so, if he's a good storyteller, because he can make the story come to life. And many people love that. They're like, oh, pastor, you made that story come to life. You made it so real. You made it so Oh, I loved it. I've never, I've never seen the story that way. Now, the question is, maybe you never saw the story that way because he just made up a story. Like, that's not the actual story. This is my problem with shows like The Chosen and other things that take Bible stories and try to bring them to life. They embellish. They add to, and so now you read those stories with the embellishment in mind. And so now you're assigning motive or, or emotion or feeling to maybe a biblical character where the text doesn't really tell you what the motive was, what the emotion behind it was. You're just now speculating. Well, guess what? How much can you embellish the story before you're actually no longer preaching the actual story? You're preaching the embellishment. And when does preaching the embellishment stops actually then mean it means you're no longer preaching the text? Now, it's hard not to do that. Here's a woman with an issue of blood for 12 years. It's hard as a preacher not to want to say, oh, she had to be at the end of her rope and and she, and like you can just start going and going. But where is that line when you cross it? And now you're, what you're giving people is not the inerrant. Remember, they stood for the reading of the inerrant, inspired, infallible word. And everybody in the background was like, amen. Then he read the inspired, inerrant, infallible word. And then he starts retelling the story. And he's already adding stuff to the story. Does that bother you? Now, you're, you, you are either used to this or not used to this, depending on your pastor at your church, right? Some of your pastors are great communicators. They excel in their communication skills. They can tell stories. They have great inflection. They can capture emotion. That's a great talent. But sometimes that talent is detrimental to the clear exposition of God's word. Some of your pastors may be no good at that. They're not good at that in any way, shape, or form. No good at that in any way, shape, or form. However, they're very good at sticking to the text. Now, the thing is, sometimes the pastor who's not the great communicator, who can't really embellish or tell the story, he may be more faithful to the text. But guess what you get? A lot of people are like, oh, man. Ugh, like they, because they don't, it just seems boring. It seems dry. So there's got to be a balance. Someone just said in, in, the, in the chat, powerful point and a good reminder to me, the listener. Well, I hope it's, a, look, it's a, it's a powerful reminder for me because I listen to sermons and there's been times I'm like, whoa, man, that was good. And then I'll be like, wait a minute. What was so good about that? Did I really learn the text or just, man, he was such a good communicator? For a pastor, good, being a good communicator sometimes can be detrimental to actually being a good Bible teacher. The average listener, I don't think, sees it that way. Just a thought. How much can you embellish the story? How much can you embellish on a biblical text? 
Man, I've heard the story of David's great adultery. I've heard that story told so many different ways, so many nuances. What was in David's mind? What was in her mind? What was her motive? What was David's motive? And you'll go. And then when you read the actual text, you sometimes wonder, where did any of this come from? And it really shades how you see the text. You can't let the pastor create a narrative that is not actually coming from the text. But see, you'll think it's coming from the text because, well, he read the text. Then he began to embellish on it. It's subtle. It's dangerous. And it's detrimental to true biblical hermeneutics. I have to remind myself as a speaker because, man, I'm, I love that. If I get a good story like that, just step back. Let me go. Man, I can just take off. And with me, who knows? I'm going to be adding who knows what to the story. Then an alien spacecraft came down. And then there, then there was a, a, an invasion. I'm like, who knows? I mean, you get me involved in a story. I can just go, 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 go. So I have to, I have to be careful. But I, but I know that it, you can get caught up. You can make it funny. You can make it dramatic. You can make it emotional. And, and, and the listeners eat that stuff up. And then you destroy the actual meaning of the text. You may get more downloads. You may get more streams and you may get more people in attendance. But what they, what those people don't get is they get a good storyteller. They just don't get the word of God. And she said, I'm done with you. And she changed doctors. And for a few moments this morning, I'd like to preach on the subject. subject she changed doctors. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you today for the Word of God. May you bless it. And oh God, we know that we live in a sick nation, a generation that is ill, deeply ill. And God, I pray that at some point, at some place, finally they might look unto thee and be saved and turn to you and believe you and reach out and touch that seamless garment. Settle upon us and help us today. Thank you for what you'll accomplish this morning. And God, we thank you that upon this rock, you've said you would build your church. That the gates of hell would not prevail against it. The confession that thou art the Christ, the Son of a living God. And I pray you'll help us today. Thank you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. All of God's people said together. You may be. Okay, a lot to say about the prayer. All right, couple of things. Number one, I talk about it all the time. When pastors pray, when pastors pray before their sermon or pray at the end of their sermon. And I pray at the end of the sermon mainly just because it's expected. Sometimes I hate myself for my prayer. I try to always go back and listen to my prayer after I'm done. And I usually want to kick myself. I've got to find a better way to do it. But here's the thing. Let's just remind ourselves. Prayer is us communicating with God. Prayer is us communicating with God. So we got to be careful. I'm not saying he's doing this. I'm just speaking about prayers of pastors in general when it's connected with a church service. You just can't like, oh, I'm going to pray before my sermon. And what do you start doing? You start preaching your sermon. And a roundabout way, did he not just kind of give you an idea where he's going? He just gave you an idea. Hey, our the nation is sick. So he's going to take this story of the woman with an issue of blood and he's going to kind of turn it into an allegory. And in his allegory, the woman's going to be the nation that is sick and we have an issue of blood. And the only way for the nation to be right is to reach out and touch the hem of his garment. So he's going to take this story, almost turn it into an allegory. That's the way he prayed it, turn it into an allegory. But is that the point of the story? Is the point of the story descriptive or is is it prescriptive? Is this telling how a nation can be healed? Is this like, what are we doing with this? But see his prayer, he almost started preaching the sermon. Now, maybe I'm wrong, but I think he just kind of gave us a little headway, a little hint of where, a little idea of where he is going. And if he did, then he really was getting a head start on his sermon. And then sometimes at the end of the sermon, what does a pastor do in his prayer? He tries to reiterate the sermon. He tries to, to, to summarize it. He's still preaching. Sometimes we start get a head start in our preaching. 
with the opening prayer, and then we get a, a, a one more time of, to review the sermon at the end. That's not what prayer is designed for. It's not designed for preaching. It's designed for speaking to God. So I'm not such a big, I know, and there's times I won't pray. I I never pray at the beginning. And sometimes I won't pray at the end, but I've had literally, we've had visitors at my church. Why didn't you pray? Like, where was the prayer? And I'm like, well, because I don't know. I was afraid that I would just end up preaching during my prayer. Like, like people don't seem to understand the issue, but to me, it's disrespectful. If I'm supposed to be talking to God, talk to God, right? If someone's sitting there talking to you, but they're not really talking to you, they're, 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 they're looking at you, but they're really talking to someone else. I think you would probably get offended. Like, well, well, wait a minute. I thought we're talking. No, no, I'm, I'm talking to, 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 I'm talking to her right over here next to me. Well, I thought you were talking to me. I think you would get offended by that. Well, that's the, the creator of the universe. When I pray to address him, talk to him, guess what he doesn't need? He doesn't need me to rehash my sermon. He doesn't need me to, to start giving a hint of where my sermon is going. He's God. He doesn't need me to preach to him. Now, I'm not saying exactly that's what exactly happened there, but it does give us some insight. about. And I look, I've been guilty of it a billion times. And I think every preacher on earth has been guilty of it. Something we have to remind ourselves of. But he, to me, when he was, when I was listening to that prayer, I was like, he's letting me know hermeneutically where this is going. Now, I could be wrong, but it seems like he's going to turn this into more of an allegory for a sick nation who has an issue of blood, who needs to talk, t- touch the hem of the garment of Jesus and then will be healed. How does that translate in any meaningful, practical way? Let's see. Be seated. Thank you for standing for so long. Our text tonight finds, or this morning, finds the Lord Jesus coming back to the region of Capernaum. Most of you know that was his headquarters, especially in the early portion of his ministry. And he would go there and stay in that part of the world and uh, preach the gospel and give out the word of God. The night before, he had gone to Gadara. And while there, he had healed a man who was demon-possessed uh, with a group of de- demons that was so many, they called him a legion, that he called to go down into a herd of swine and went down into the Sea of Galilee. Now Jesus comes back uh, by a ship the next morning and finds a great crowd of people waiting to hear the word of God, waiting to hear him preach. And a man named Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, comes to Christ and says, my daughter is sick of a fever and Jesus is on the way to Jairus' house to heal his little girl. While on the way, the Bible tells us a certain woman, no one gives her name, we do not know who she was, but a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years. Study the Bible you're going to find out that first of all she was sickly. She was a very sick woman. She had an issue of blood, probably an internal hemorrhage and most Bible scholars believe that that hemorrhage was likely an STD, something she had brought upon herself because of a life of sin. Whoa! Okay, okay. We got we got to work on this first. Someone says it's also not de- designed for moms to make theological points to their listening children, which I'm guilty of a billion times. Yeah, and also I would say the closing the closing prayer, it's not also the time for people to start gathering and putting putting away all of their stuff and because a lot of people like they're not even paying like oh, it's prayer time. I'm going to put my Bible away. I'm going to put everything on my bag. Get gather the kids. Okay. All right. He's almost done praying. Go. Okay. It's no, just just, just it's prayer. Just someone's communicating with God. Everyone needs to stop what they're doing and just focus on that. Okay. Now, back to that. Someone just said that in the uh, chat. All right. Now, back to the sermon. He just said that most likely this woman had an STD, and this issue of blood is something she brought upon herself. All right. Now, yeah, yeah. Someone just said, "Is that part of? Is that part in the text?" All right. Now he says, "Bible scholars seem to believe this." Now here's what I would challenge you to do. I, I don't have time to do this right now because we're already at 33 minutes, and I don't want this sermon review to go past the actual conference that begins tonight. All right. But here is my challenge for you today, my theology central students. All right. Are you ready? 
I need you to do your research. I need you to use Google, Siri, Alexa, friend, foe, phone, text, fax machine, beeper. I don't care what technological device you use. See if you can find anything that would indicate this woman had an STD and that she brought her issue of blood upon herself because of her sinful lifestyle. Because that's what he just clearly implied that, hey, this woman has an issue of blood. She brought it on herself because she has an STD. Now, I don't know how you would come to this conclusion. I don't even know where you would come to this conclusion. But maybe there's something I'm missing. All right. I I have studied this text Many times, but this is why you listen to sermons, because you hear new things, new perspectives, new hypotheses. So we take the hypotheses as a possibility, maybe even as a probability, and then we research it to see what we can find. So, ladies and gentlemen, did this woman have an issue of blood because of an STD? And and therefore, this issue of blood is something she brought upon herself. Now, For now, just continue to listen to the review and then you can start research. Some of you are already starting to research it. I see you. Stop what you're doing. Pay attention. We got to make it through the rest of the sermon review. Just write that down. Research. Was the woman with an issue of blood? Was it this a call? Was this due to an STD? And then you can see if you can figure that out. I don't know exactly how you would do this. I don't know what... I don't know. I don't know. Unless the phrase issue of blood in the Greek indicates a certain kind of disease that people at that time were familiar. Maybe outside of the Bible, that phrase issue of blood always referenced an STD. Maybe there is some evidence that would lead us in that direction. But here's the thing. If the text, does the text, here's, I think this is the real question. Does the text, do we need to figure out what caused the issue of blood? Because the text doesn't tell us what caused it. Is the text, should we impose upon the text? This woman, she got, she's, she was getting what she deserved. She brought this on herself. Does the text indicate that, hey, you deserve this because you have an STD? I, I like, even if we can identify that it was an STD, clearly that does the text seem to indicate that, Indicate that she had done something wrong? She was hemorrhaging. She could not get well. She was unclean. If you study Leviticus 15, you know that a woman with an issue was an unclean person. And if they touched you, you would be unclean as well. Now that is a more pertinent point. She would have been unclean. I believe it's Leviticus 15, 25. Five, she would have been unclean, and I think anyone who touched her would have been unclean. I believe that's Leviticus 15.25. Now, this brings in some possible theological implications and may even give us a reason to kind of see maybe a spiritual picture here, right? She's unclean under the old covenant. She is guilty under the old covenant law. She is, quote unquote, corrupted under that system, right? Maybe we're going to get a picture of law and gospel here. I don't know. Let's see. This woman was sickly. She was suffering. The Bible said in verse number 26 that she suffered, or verse uh, verse 26, she had suffered uh, many things of many physicians. One doctor after another told her, I've got the cure. You give me a certain amount, and you're going to get better. One after another, they took her money, and they, again, uh, she, she followed with another disappointment, heartache, and loss. She was sickly. She was suffering. I'm sure that she was sorrowful. She got nothing better, but the Bible said, rather, she grew worse. She got worse and worse all the time. She could not get help. She could not find healing. And this sorrowful woman, now we find that she had spent all that she had on these physicians. She was sick. She was sorrowful, suffering. And yes, she was spent. She had tried it all. 
She had tried everything you could possibly imagine to get better. Every uh, time she heard about a new physician in town, she would try that one and try the next one and went all the way down through the gamut until finally she was broke. She was uh, broken hearted and there she is in a sick condition uh, and in all kinds of trouble. I can tell you that I came into fundamentalism a bit late in life. I came in as a young man out of a life of sin and God changed my life from the inside out and I'm so grateful to be able to say to you that I am a new creature in Christ because of what he has done for me. And I- okay, I'm not even going to address this because you know I'm a new creature in Christ. The old is gone. Everything is new. So you're saying you no longer have a sinful nature. You are new in your position, in your practice. You're still a sinner. Maybe different sins but still a sinner and still a sinful nature, unless they believe in the eradication of the old man, which I know they don't, but this is such common. This is one of those things. It's called Christianese. We just say words because that's what all the other Christians say. And we never stop to think of the theological implications of said words that we are saying to say that you're a new creature in Christ. Now practically means that you are saying I'm new. The old is gone. Everything is new, meaning there is no more sinful nature, which would mean the eradication of the old man, meaning that not only can you be perfect, you should be perfect because you're basically sinless now. Well, that's not true. We continue to sin because the sinful nature is not eradicated. It's not eradicated to to glorification. So you can't say you are a new creature. The old is gone and all is new. Now you can only say that that is true positionally, not practically. And how it's true positionally is because by faith, the perfect righteousness of Christ is imputed to your account and you're declared to be perfect and holy and righteous, even though in practice you are not. But okay, if you want to stand in front of everyone and tell them that you're a new creature and that everything is new, then expect that crowd to judge you on the basis of you being able to be perfect. And well, I'm assuming you fail that test every single day, just like I do and everyone else does. All right. I remember coming in to, uh, to, church, to church and trying to figure it all out. I didn't know a Baptist from a Methodist from a Pentecostal. Didn't know any of it. But the more I studied the Bible, the more I was led of God to join an independent fundamental Baptist church. I went to a little college that doesn't even exist anymore. And a part of the curriculum was every week we had to read a copy of the Sword of the Lord and give a report on the sermons that we read. I don't even believe that the dean of that college believed in the sword of the Lord. But we read it anyway. It was in Kansas City, same city you were in. And uh, this little obscure place I was learning, I looked at the sword of the Lord. The first one, uh, my first impression was, did I have to have glasses like that? There was Dr. Oliver Green, there was Dr. Bob Gray, and there was Dr. Jack Howells all on the the front page, and they all had the same glasses. I thought, I guess I have to have those black glasses uh, in order to be spiritual. Then I started reading the magazine and reading the public Publication and God began to change my life, and it became, uh, by conviction, an independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist by conviction. And by the grace of God, through these years, the Lord has kept us. But uh, one thing, when I came into this, there was a big shift going on. I went to the Southwide Baptist Fellowship for the first time. Man, I couldn't wait to go. I was so fired up. I thought this was the mecca of fundamentalism. Most of the preachers were preaching against the independent. Baptists. They were preaching against us. I wanted to say, hey, wait a minute, boys. Uh, You might be heading towards new evangelicalism. I'm coming out of that stuff. There's nothing over there that's going to help you say amen. But brother, uh, they were trying this. They were trying that. Okay, now I got to jump in just because for a historical perspective, it is, I love hearing this because it's so important. If you study your church history, you need to know that evangelicalism and fundamentalism split, right? The, the there was a split, and the evangelicalism took a more a, not a more non militant approach, a much more um, ecumenical approach, a much more friendly approach, a much more loving approach. We don't want to fight. We don't want to be so argue about doctrine and theology. And many of them embraced some of the ideas that were coming from Europe, higher criticism and some of those kinds of things. So evangelicalism took a more, uh, we could say a softer approach, a non-militant approach. 
And there was a lot of compromise, didn't want to necessarily draw theological distinctions, wanted a little bit more ecumenical approach. That was kind of your evangelical world there. Now, there was a lot, there was a lot of variety within the evangelical world, but there was much more of this kind of, uh, let's, you know, agree, let's, let's, uh, you know, let's agree that we disagree, right? Let's agree to disagree and kind of just do our own thing. Where the fundamentalist was much more like, no, we're not going to compromise. No, this is right and this is wrong. This is true doctrine. This is false doctrine. And they took a more militant tone. And you kind of get this split between evangelicalism and fundamentalism. Fundamentalism was very concerned about higher criticism coming in from Europe. They were, they were, they were concerned about the compromises they felt were happening in seminaries. They were definitely against the ecumenical movement. They were uh, typically very, very anti the charismatic movement. Th- this was kind of more the fundamentalism. And there was that split. Now you could talk in, 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 within the evangelicalism, you had evangelicalism and then the new evangelicalism. Okay. But so they were transitioning as well. And then over here, you still had the fundamentalists. And now I believe the fundamentalists started off fighting for the fundamentals of the faith. And then it kind of, to me, transitioned into more of a, at times, an external righteousness, almost legalistic approach. And some of the fundamentals of the faith were overshadowed by, we don't listen to rock and roll. We don't go to movies. We don't wear, have long hair and started just going to these list of external behaviors. And so, well... You can kind of see. So he's he's talking about some of this. Hey, you're you guys are going back to new evangelicalism. I'm leaving it. He he's talking about that split. And it's just it's good to kind of just see how Christianity has gone through these ups and downs and twists and turns and splits and divisions. And then one gimmick and one campaign and one newfangled idea came up after another. And I found out that it seemed like every new idea, we didn't get better, we just got worse. We got further along and farther from God than we were before that. And, uh, and along the way, I've learned one thing. If we're ever going to get anywhere, we have got to get back to Jesus one more time. We must get back to the gospel of Jesus Christ and sharing that and giving it out and preaching that and so winning and giving our lives for the glory of God. Several years ago, I went to a conference that had changed my life, and uh, the last time I ever attended, they'd given over for the, for the theme of taking care of yourself, juicing and, uh, and vitamins and this sort of a thing. Man, I had a preacher that I always looked up to, and he was teaching us how to do health food instead of rearing back and preaching. They handcuffed him and put him uh, on the side instead of uh, turning him loose and letting him run. And I remember going to a restaurant after the conference that we would go to every night. Man, there'd be preachers there, soul winning, fired up, stirred up. They were all sitting around talking about what kind of bicycle they were going to buy, what kind of vitamins they were going to get, what kind of juice machine they were going to buy. Listen, friends, they got way off track. They need to get back to the same things that got us here of old, old time religion and, yes, timeless religion and serving God for His glory and honor. Boy, I remember going to conferences on prayer. I remember going to the conferences on soul winning. Say amen. How many of you still believe in soul winning? Man, I mean, how many of you are soul winning? Amen. And I mean, regularly winning people to Jesus Christ. I remember the conferences on the King James Bible. Boy, I got stirred up about the King James Bible. Already had one, already believed in it, but I knew now why I love the King James Authorized Bible and on and on. And I believe this with all of my heart. We have tried all kinds of things, tried all kinds of gimmicks, but finally she heard about someone that could truly change lives. She had spent it all. She was sorrowful. She was sick. She, was in, uh, she had tried doctors and debt. And now she had suffered many disappointments. But when she heard about Jesus, she heard about, not about a church, not about a trend, not about a gimmick, not about a new routine, not about some new uh, ritual she didn't have a TV, so he wasn't a TV preacher or some trendy favorite guy that everybody listens to. No, she heard about one who was named the Son of a Living God. She heard about Jesus, that he'd already cleansed the leper. He'd always raised one from the dead. She heard about one who could save anybody, anywhere, at any time. She heard about a great physician who heals the sick, 
the lost he came to save. Jesus said in Luke 19 verse 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. He, she heard about this great physician who was setting up shop in Capernaum and people were coming to him and getting help and getting healing. She heard about a, a great physician uh, who had a sign out that said walk-ins welcome. Amen? No appointment necessary. The doctor is always in. No HMO needed here. He even makes house calls. He's on his way to Jairus' house. He's going to help him out. And she said, if he can do that, he can help me. And then she heard, wait a minute. He's the best doctor you've ever heard of in your life. He's never lost a patient. Say amen. And the Bible makes it clear in John 17. Jesus said, all that the Father hath given unto me are mine. He said, no man shall pluck them out of my hand. And she said, I've got to get to him. If that's how it really is, I